Hello all of my history loving friends. I am Madam Morbid. Welcome to my morbid world. This is a history channel. If you like history and you like dark and mysterious stories, I think you might like this channel. So if you like what you see here today, please like the video, please subscribe. Today I am in Kansas City and I am here at Union Station. On June 17, 1933, in this parking lot, four police officers lost their lives, essentially right here in this spot. It came to be known as the Kansas City Massacre. There's a lot of mystery surrounding this event though, and a lot of people wonder to this day who was actually involved. Specifically, was Pretty Boy Floyd here? I'm going to start off by telling you what we do know and then we can talk about things that people wonder about. This all started with a low-level gangster named Frank Nash. Frank had been in jail in Leavenworth prison but he had escaped and he had been on the run for three years. He had at this point recently been recaptured hiding out in Hot Springs, Arkansas. And on this day, on June 17th, 1933, he would be coming through Union Station on his way back to prison. Some of his buddies had found out that he was going to be here and their plan was to break him out. So they were waiting in this parking lot in a car with machine guns, waiting for the police to bring Frank out. Here's a little bit of information about Nash and his criminal career. He was mostly a criminal active in Oklahoma. He'd been convicted of murder and burglary using explosives. He'd been sent to Leavenworth in 1924 for these crimes, specifically for robbing a mail train in Oklahoma. By 1930, he had a reputation as a very good prisoner and had been given the privilege of being able to work outside of the prison. He had gained the guards trust and he used that opportunity to slip away and escape. It took three years for the Bureau to track him down to Hot Springs and two officers were sent to arrest him there. One was Joe Lackey and the other was Frank Smith. They took the police chief of McAllister, Oklahoma, a man named Otto Reed with them. They did this because Reed knew Nash. He had been one of the officers to capture him, track him down. He'd been pursuing him for years and they thought he would be able to help. And so one day before the shootout on June 16th is when they went to Hot Springs and took him into custody. They found him downtown in a cigar store. They put him in a car at gunpoint and then they drove him to Fort Smith, Arkansas, where he boarded the Missouri Pacific train headed to Kansas City. It was supposed to arrive at 7 a.m. at Union Station. It was 15 minutes late. When they got there, the head of the Kansas City Bureau was going to meet them there. His name was Reed Vetterly. Because they were worried about security, they decided not to take the train all the way to Leavenworth, even though they could have, because it would have required an hour layover at Union Station, and they were so worried about what ended up happening that they did not want to spend an hour just sitting there like sitting ducks. So they decided to take a car and drive the rest of the way. Nash's friends, cronies, whatever you want to call them, they had learned he had been captured and they began calling each other and they set up this plan to rescue him. They only had a night to do this, to plan for this. Vern Miller would lead the rescue effort he had pulled off jobs with Frank Nash, considered him a very good friend. Vern was living in Kansas City. He was living under an assumed name in a middle-class neighborhood in South Kansas City. The plan was Miller would have accomplices who would get the drop on the law enforcement officers. They would force them to release Nash. The plan was that no one would get hurt. So Miller went to Union Station. He met a leader of the Kansas City mob while he was there, John Lazia. Lazia worked with political boss Thomas Pendergast. He had control of 
local rackets and of the police department, frankly. So if anything was going to go down in his city, Lazia expected to know about it. So Vern Miller let him know, and he may have asked for Lazia to help him in the attempt. Now that Lazia knows what their plans are, everything is in place, they sit and wait in the parking lot, and all they had to do was wait for them to get there. It pulled in at 7.15 in the morning. Reed Vetterly was waiting as the train pulled up. Ray Caffrey was with him. He was new to the local Kansas City office, and he was going to be the one to drive Nash and the other police officers to Leavenworth. Two Kansas City police detectives were also there, William J. Red Grooms and Frank Hermanson. Agent Lackey left the train. He went, surveyed the platform to make sure it was safe. He went back onto the train to remove Nash from his seat. Nash got off the train. He had seven guards, the two bureau agents, the police chief, Reed, who had captured him, the two Kansas City agents who met the train, and the two Kansas City policemen. Nash and these police officers would have come in through a door at the bottom of these stairs. That door is no longer there. They would have walked up these stairs, then they would have exited this door, and they would have walked down this hall right here, which I cannot go down right now because it's closed for a private event. A security guard was nice enough to bring me back here and show me where they would have gotten off the train. So I cannot make that final walk. You can imagine the seven officers and the prisoner walking down this hallway in a V formation. I have to assume that Nash would have been in the middle of this formation. Then he would have walked around here and out through these doors where the car was waiting for them. The car was parked right here, right in front of the two giant pillars. Ray Caffrey would be the officer to drive him to Leavenworth and his Chevrolet was parked right here facing me. Next to his car was a Plymouth. Agent Vetterly was unarmed. There were two Kansas City police officers with them who carried 38 caliber handguns and they walked to the front of the car to keep watch. It was one of those two-door sedans that to get into the back you had to push the front seat, lay it forward to get in. So Agent Lackey and Chief Reed, they both had shotguns and they got in through the passenger side and crawled into the back. Nash started to sit between them, which is usually where prisoners sat. They didn't want him to do that. They asked him to get out and get in the front and he ended up sitting in the driver's seat. They wanted him to be there so they could watch him. He was sitting in the driver's seat because they needed to push that passenger seat forward for people to get in. So then Agent Smith got in after Nash had moved. Smith had a 38 caliber handgun and a 45. So Agent Caffrey, while they're all doing this, he has a 38. He shut the passenger door and walked around the front of the car to get in in the driver's seat. It was at this moment that Vern Miller and his accomplices emerged with machine guns. One of them shouted, put them up, up, up. And the next thing everyone know, everyone's firing. There's shotguns going off, there's 38s, there's 45s. It lasted about 30 seconds and five people were killed in it, four of them police officers. The prisoner died first. He was shot in the back of the head. Agent Caffrey was shot and mortally wounded as he came around the front of the car. Grooms and Hermanson were killed. Chief Reed, who was sitting in the back seat, he was killed. Lackey and Smith, who were sitting next to him, they both ducked and survived. Vetterly fell to the ground after the shooting started, and then shortly thereafter, he jumped to his feet and he raced toward the doors. And basically then it was over. The rescue had been botched. Vern Miller and his accomplices jumped in their car and raced away. Now these are the things that are not disputed. When this was all over, Miller got in trouble with everybody. He was on the run. He was one of the most wanted men by the FBI. Everyone in the underworld was also mad at him for bringing so much attention and so much heat down on the criminal world. He spent a couple of days hiding out in his home and then he took off and lived a life on the run. Although the FBI was after him, it was actually the underworld that got him first. In November of 1934, his body was found in a drainage ditch in Detroit. 
He had been beaten to death, mostly by blows to his head. It is not known who, but some mobster somewhere had put a hit out on him and had him killed. The big questions that have always remained is who killed who that day and who was there? The FBI account says that they were hiding behind the radiator of another car that they shouted, let them have it, and then killed the two Kansas City police officers in the front of the car first. Then shots from one or more of them killed Nash and Chief Reed inside the car. And they don't mention at all who shot Agent Caffrey. And it wasn't long after this all started that doubts started to be raised in the press about this account. Robert Unger in the 1990s really looked at this case. He was a teacher. He was a former reporter for the Kansas City Star and Times. And he had written a series of articles about this massacre for the Times in the 80s. He had requested all of these FBI documents and he did this through the Freedom of Information Act. I mean, he just kept getting them. Even after he had published, they still kept drifting in. He cataloged them, he went through them, and he came out with a book called The Union Station Massacre, The Original Sin of J. Edgar Hoover's FBI. It was first published in 1997. I wish I could have gotten a hold of it because it was printed so long ago. I could not find a library where I could get it uh, quickly anyway. But I can tell you what he says in the book. I was able to find that information. The most important thing he points out, and I, I'm, forensics don't lie. If you look at this photograph right here, there is glass on the hood of the car. The only way you get glass on the hood of the car is if Frank Nash is shot from within the car. Nash was shot in the back of the head. There is glass on the hood of the car. He had to have been shot by an officer. Lackey was sitting right behind him. And Unger argues that Agent Lackey, who was right behind Nash, probably mistakenly grabbed Chief Reed's shotgun. It was short barreled, it was 16 gauge, it was equipped to fire rapidly when pumped. Lackey had never worked with it. It was loaded with ball bearings also instead of buckshot. Unger says Lackey probably grabbed this weapon and he thought he was pumping it to get ready for a potential firefight when he saw Vern Miller. But instead of it pumping, it fired twice into the back of Nash's head and it also hit Agent Caffrey as he ran across the front of the car. And this is the shots that started everybody firing. When Agent Caffrey was autopsied, it was found that his fatal wound had been caused by a ball bearing. And the FBI didn't even try to explain this away. They just ignored in their report who killed Caffrey. Also, one of the Kansas City policemen, I don't know which one, his autopsy also found a wound that probably came from a shotgun. And there was also a ball bearing found in the Plymouth parked beside the car. They found one ball bearing in the floorboard. The gunmen did not have shotguns, none of them. They had machine guns, they had revolvers. Officer Grooms had been killed by two machine gun bullets, so he was definitely killed by the gangsters. Chief Reed was hit in the head by a machine gun bullet and also from a 38 caliber handgun, which means he was probably shot by both Miller's crew and a police officer. In his official report, to the FBI, Lackey said that the shotgun he was carrying jammed and was useless during the gunfight. When he testified at the trial after the massacre, he denied sitting behind Nash at all. He claimed to have been on the other side of the back seat, which contradicted everything he had said before. And it also contradicted what other witnesses had reported about the event. Who was with Miller has always been a highly debated topic. The FBI was adamant that the two gunmen with Miller were Pretty Boy Floyd and Adam Reschetti. They had two sources who claimed that they were involved. One was an underworld character from Kansas City. The mob was trying to kill this individual and it could have been in an attempt to save his own life and get Bureau protection that he named Floyd and Machete, possibly because the Bureau wanted him to. The other one was 
Miller's girlfriend. And she said this after a very long interrogation by the Bureau. And again, I have seen so many documentaries about people claiming whatever the police want to hear to get out of these grueling interrogations. But once they had these two people saying this, that they were involved, then they used that to really go after both of them. And in October of 1934, Floyd was shot in Ohio and killed. Rachetti was captured nearby and he was put on trial for the slayings of the policemen. <laughs> the only evidence they had, other than the two people who had testified he was there, was a fingerprint on a beer bottle at Miller's apartment, which is not a whole lot of evidence, in my opinion. That's not even at the crime scene. They have no physical evidence at the crime scene whatsoever. And I'm sorry, a bottle with a fingerprint is really easy to plant if you want to. So I... I am not convinced. However, Rachetti was convicted and he was executed for this in the gas chamber in October 1938. Now, Unger questions the involvement of both of them. The main reason to question this is Floyd had never dealt with Frank Nash. He did not know Frank Nash in any way and he did not benefit from Frank Nash being freed. Questioning Rachetti's involvement is pretty much the same. He didn't know him. He had never worked with him. He had no reason to benefit from wanting to break him out of jail. So if neither one of them were involved, then we have no idea who the other two gunmen were that day. But it's safe to assume they were probably close friends of Nash who had had dealings with him in the past, but who they might have been went to Vern Miller's grave. I took video of these holes in the granite. Word of mouth has spread that these are bullet holes forever. I thought they were bullet holes. I filmed them and numerous people were pointing them out. Yet this book that I have been using to tell you this story says that in the 1990s they did tests and in these tests it revealed that machine gun bullets could not have penetrated the granite. All that it would have done is just ricocheted off. All of these pictures I'm showing you that I was told were bullet holes, some of them which had been repaired, evidently are not. And that makes sense to me because where some of them were located made absolutely no sense given where the shooting was taking place. They were located on a part of the building that would not have been open to gunfires. This makes sense to me now that I'm finding out that apparently these aren't bullet holes and can't be. It certainly makes a good story though. I mean, obviously the tourists eat it up when they look at this and see, oh, these are bullet holes. But I guess ballistics tests have shown that bullets would not penetrate this granite. So that's gonna be it for me today, guys. I hope you have enjoyed the tour of the beautiful Union Station. I hope you have enjoyed hearing this story of this legendary massacre, which probably was just a big accident. And once one person fires, everybody starts firing and it costs the lives of five people, which is very unfortunate. And Hoover was able to use that to strengthen the Bureau, to use it as an argument for why they needed more power. It helped bring us the modern FBI as we know it today. I do not believe that Pretty Boy Floyd or Adam Rachetti were there. I never really trust anything that came out of Hoover's FBI because he just made stuff up if it made life convenient for himself, if it made it easier to catch somebody, or in this case, if it gave him the ability to use it as an excuse to strengthen the Bureau to catch Pretty Boy Floyd. I think he very well knew that Floyd was not there. I think he knew Lackey had accidentally killed an officer and the prisoner, but he didn't need the public to know that. And it was important that they didn't know that. That is my take on things. As always with history, all we have is what evidence we have. And given that Robert Unger probably has seen more evidence on this than any person on earth, other than the FBI in the 30s, I trust his judgment.